Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, we're going to read three texts from Matthew 26 and 27, in just a moment. Ronald Bailey went tearing through the back roads of North Carolina in his fancy new convertible. In the course of that joyride, he sideswiped Fletcher Dilbeck's truck. Upon being apprehended by the authorities, it was soon determined that Ronald Bailey was the son of John Judson Bailey, a very wealthy and powerful man. And Ronald Bailey believed, because he had always been taught, that there were no consequences for his actions. He lived as he wanted to live, and any time he got into trouble, Daddy just bailed him out. And he insulted the law, and he insulted the courts, and he insulted everybody that was associated with his arrest and his apprehension. But it wasn't long before he figured out that the the path that he was on was not a path that was conducive to long-term success. And he eventually owned up to his misdeeds and paid the punishment for his crimes. Andy Griffith, Season 2, Episode 15. In Matthew 26, we find almost that same attitude present in the life of Judas Iscariot. A person who, while, as we will soon see, who lived his life as he wanted to live it, all the while believing that no matter what he did, as, as Ronald Bailey, as Ronald Bailey believed Daddy would fix it, Ronald Bailey or Judas Iscariot believed Jesus would fix it. And he had some reason, good reason, to believe that. But in Matthew 26, beginning in verse number 6, it says, Now Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. And a woman came to him having an alabaster flax, a very costly ointment. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But his disciples saw it, and they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, in Matthew's account, we don't know really who instigated this statement. But in John's account, we do. This statement was instigated by Judas Iscariot. But John said in John chapter 12 and verse 6, Judas said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he kept the money bag and took for himself the things that were in it. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. And assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, in the whole world what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted him out thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now for the sake of time, we won't read the actual text of the betrayal, but it begins in in Matthew 26 and verse 47. 
Well, we know that Jesus has been in the garden. He has been praying. He has been weeping. He has been literally, as the Bible says, his sweat fell, as it were, as great drops of blood. And in the midst of all this, Judas Iscariot comes with his angry mob, with swords and staves, as coming to, to arrest a thief. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. And the Lord is carried away, apprehended and carried away into custody and taken to the house of the high priest. Chapter 27, verse 1. And when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Now this has always intrigued me. Judas knew that Jesus was innocent. Right? But what does the text say there in verse 3? When he saw that he was what? Condemned. What did Judas think was going to happen when he sold Jesus into the hands of that mob? What did he expect? Let me submit for your consideration. He expected that the Lord was going to take care of that matter. Just like he had handled every other situation for the last three years, every time a problem rose, Jesus fixed it. In John chapter 2, they ran out of wine at the wedding feast, and Jesus fixed it. In Luke chapter 4, they picked up Jesus and sought to throw him off a cliff to kill him, and Jesus fixed it. People were sick. And Jesus fixed it. Thousands needed to be fed. And Jesus fixed it. In John 8, they picked up stones to throw at Jesus to kill him. And Jesus fixed it. In John 10, they took up stones to throw at Jesus again. And Jesus fixed it. There was never a situation in the ministry of Christ that Judas had ever seen that the Lord could not get out of. So what's the thinking of Judas? Perhaps it is. I'll deliver him into the hands of this mob. I'll collect my 30 pieces. I'll keep my 30 pieces of silver. Jesus will get out of it. And no one will ever be the wiser. But see, this wasn't the time that Jesus was going to fix everything. In fact, it was the time for Jesus to accept responsibility. Not for his actions, but for ours. And thus Jesus went to the cross. And he died for us that we might have the remission of our sins. In a way, it can be rightfully said that in this situation, Jesus didn't fix it. But on the other hand, we can look at the end result and we can see, you know what? In not allowing himself or utilizing his ability to be delivered, he fixed it. He fixed it. He fixed it for Peter, who had denied knowing him three times. He fixed it really for Judas, if Judas... Had been, uh, had been man enough and, and courageous enough to admit his faults, Judas could have been forgiven just like, just like anybody else. But he also fixed it for us. As, as we just sang the song that, that Dwayne led us in, it says, He died alone for you, for you and me. 
too many people in this world and too many Christians in this world living their lives as if they can do whatever they want and somehow at the end Jesus is just going to fix it. I'll not be faithful to read my Bible every day, but that's no big deal. I won't be faithful to attend all the services, but that's no big deal. I won't be faithful to watch my tongue either in, in the words that I, I use that are profane or in, in line or being deceitful or gossiping. I don't have to be careful but because Jesus is going to fix it. I'll just do as I please and Jesus is going to fix it. Look, Jesus has already fixed it. It's up to us to live like Jesus fixed it. Too many people are going to get to the judgment and think Jesus is just going to, just going to erase everything. He's going to fix it. But it's not going to work like that. It's never been designed to work like that. In the Old Testament, men sinned and then men sacrificed for that sin. Under the New Testament, Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins. Now it's up to us to live up to the calling that he's called us. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As we partake of this memorial, we are reminded of what Jesus has done to fix our, our, our sin problem. So with that in mind, if you take your cup, I'll give thanks for the bread. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, we are thankful for Christ and his sacrifice. Father, we're thankful for his body, which is represented in this bread. That we partake in remembrance of him and what he has done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks for the cup. Again, our Father, we are thankful for the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross to secure our redemption and the remission of our sins. Father, we partake of this emblem representing his blood in remembrance of his great sacrifice and love for us and your love as well in Jesus' name. I remember the first time when I was in Ghana and saw a television. Almost 24 hours a day, there was no local programming. It was all reruns of American shows. And almost all of them soap operas. Soap operas. And so anybody in Ghana that ever had access to see a television saw America through the lens of the soap opera. Y'all shaking your head, I see you. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions that people could draw by watching soap operas if that's the only view you had of America. But one of the misconceptions that the Ghanaians had drawn was that all Americans were doctors, lawyers, and wealthy businessmen. And that everybody in America had money to burn. They all thought that. And why wouldn't they? Because that was the picture, that was the picture that had been portrayed before them. Now, even though that assessment is not accurate, not by a long shot, compared to most of the rest of the world, 
is pretty accurate. By comparison, it's pretty accurate. Most of us spend more on our electric bill every month than most people in the world will make in twice that amount of time. It's crazy. Crazy thing about it, isn't it? And I just tell you that to, for, to remind you that even though we don't, as a general rule, consider ourselves to be rich people, compared to the vast majority of, of the rest of the world, we are wealthy beyond their imagination. We have been so blessed. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, that we're to lay by and store on the first day of every week as we have been prospered. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12 and verse 24 says that our giving is accounted based on what we have, not against what we don't have, and that it is, an, it is a, a display of the proof of our love. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 24. So with that in mind, as we prepare uh, to, to give thanks for our giving, some have already given, in the, give here in the foyer. Let's be mindful of our blessings and let's give God thanks for those at this time. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our blessings by realizing that they are far more abundant than, than we recognize. Father, we know that we take for granted many of the, the things that we have. Father, we, we live as though we expect things to continue as they have for, for many years. Father, we need to realize that such can be snatched away from us in a moment's time. Uh, we know that our blessings are truly uh, uh, from your bountiful hand. We pray that our, our giving uh, reflects our recognition of your love and your bounty and our appreciation for the same in Jesus' name.